a voice of one calling. For in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our, our God. Every valley shall be raised and every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In a messenger interpretation, we find it reads this. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak softly and tenderly to Jerusalem, but also make it very clear that she has served her sentence that her sin is taken care of, forgiven. She's been punished enough and more than enough, and now it's over and done with. Thunder in the desert. Prepare for God's arrival. Make the road straight and smooth. A highway fit for our God. Fill in the valleys. Level off the hills. Smooth out the ruts. Clear out the rocks. Then God's bright glory will shine, and everyone will see it. For yes, just as God has said. You see, Advent is a journey, is a journey to joy. Advent is a journey to the joy to the world. The Lord has come. For Advent also is a journey to glad tidings of comfort and joy. But Advent can be a disappointment. For we ask the question, what if joy doesn't come? The problem is, is that joy is not a commodity that can be produced. It cannot be bought or sold or even stolen. We can't get joy on a discount at the J.C. Penney. We can't buy joy in a mug at the Applebee's. And we can't overload joy or download it. We can't lobby for it. We can't even legislate for it. We can't win it in a lawsuit and we can't even seduce it. We can't turn it on with a remote control. We can't earn it and we can't inherit it. You see, joy has become a commodity that has been overlooked and under underappreciated. But this morning, allow me to speak on the subject and ponder on the subject of courageous joy. It was around this time, about ten years, about twelve years ago, when we were my family was preparing to move from one house to another. We were staying within the same county. In, in essence, we were probably staying on the same side of town. We were just moving from one north to from the north side to the south side of the east side. More specifically, we thought about this in particular as we were moving, that we were kind of moving from one from one end of the county to the other end of the county. But we were also moving into an area that was in the midst of a growth spurt. With the development of more shopping areas also came the development of more homes, and with the development of more homes came the development of more shopping areas. So you can imagine that the commute to and from work was a daily challenge. If anyone remembers what Interstate 271 looked like within the last five or six years, you would probably know that it has and it was one of the most congested highways in the county. But if I had to put my own assessment onto it without even looking at the plans that were developed by the Ohio Department of Transportation, I would tell you that I would begin to realize and to discern that as with many people, that the freeway itself had a lot of barriers that prevented people from getting to their desired destination. It was in the same amount of time, about five or six years ago, when construction started to take place on widening the freeway. We would go from having three lanes, I guess, to about having five or six lanes. I gather that too. And all of this was in an effort to make it manageable for us to get to our destination and to respond to the growing spurt that was taking place near the south side of the county. You see, the highway is a path that leads us to whatever place we're trying to get to. And if I stay with this illustration for just with for a few minutes, you will know that there have been a lot of things that took place on I-271 that prevented us from having a smooth ride. There were some of us who can remember the holes that were on I-271 or the potholes that were there as well. Some of you might even remember the one specific one that was right there at the exit for Rockside Road. Because I can recall there were a lot of people who tried to dodge it on any, on any winter day. If you recall, there were also some things that took place, such as the redirection of the lanes. There were some orange barriers. 
There was some work that was on the bridge, and there was the work that was done on the express lanes. The area that I found to be the most challenging was the one that had to deal with the pattern shift on the freeway. I can remember not knowing exactly what was going on or what I was going to face when I entered the, the freeway on any given day. I, would, I, 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 I found myself just rolling with some of the changes, although I was a little irritated and frustrated at times. I even kind of found myself just getting adjusted to some of the lane closures. But the biggest challenge for me was the change in the traffic pattern. You see, the change in the pattern caused some inconsistencies for me. You see, on some occasions, it meant that I had to go to I-480 instead of I-271, not because I wanted to. It was because I didn't understand the pattern that it was going in. The destination sometimes changed so that it left me going, going to the left instead of going to the right or going to the right instead of going to the left. But if you ask me today to apply this illustration, and you asked me to think about it in terms of how can I reach joy? I think about it in terms of the sense of what has taken place over this last year that has shifted a little bit and that has also changed the pattern of which we go about. Can I tell you something that all throughout the year I thought of, I think I was started thinking about this and there were certain things that you did throughout the year. Mark and I just remember last night that we would tend to have a lot of different parties that we would go to during this time, and we don't have those. We would realize also that Christmas is going to look a little bit different this year, just as Thanksgiving looked a little bit different, just as the first day of school looked a little bit different, just as July 4th, Memorial Day, Labor Day, Easter, and everything in between looked a little different. Why? Because the pattern had shifted from what we were used to. We ran into some few uh, uh, some uh, obstacles and that pattern presented situations, though I'm gonna say this for you, that patterns uh, uh, also presented some situations that we may have often found ourselves in where we were even saying hallelujah instead of being fearful. See, joy has been one of those principles that the world itself so easily grabs after. So much so that it tries to define it in such a way that makes it hard to attain and challenges every positive thinking individual to elevate the importance of joy. Like all expressions of the grace of God, joy is a gift that can only be received. The joy is an expression of God's free grace. But theologically, when we talk about grace being free, we don't mean that grace is inexpensive. What we mean is that grace is free in the sense of being free, emancipated, liberated. Grace is free because we can't enslave it. Grace is free because we ourselves cannot be the ones that dictate it. Only God can. Grace is an expression of God's grace. We can't control it. We can't manufacture it. We can't tell it what to do. It can't be bought at any price. You see, the Advent and the Christmas season reminds us that we are on a pathway to attaining that joy. But sometimes the cloudiness of the hustle and the bustle of not only the holiday, but day-to-day -day life gives us reason not to see this gift. Even more, the fall that provides, she that, 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 that shields the very layers of what happens in our lives, these turmoils, these challenges, these situations, and even the unwelcoming circumstances can give us a reason to just fall and to give it more attention than just recognizing the gifts of the season. Advent gives us an opportunity to reflect on what is essential in our lives. It gives us a pause in the busyness to reflect upon the gifts from God. You see, as we take a look at the scripture today, here we are in the book of Isaiah. And it was during the prophet Isaiah's time that it was custom that if you wanted to invite a king to visit your neighborhood, your community, your village, before you extended an invitation to the king to come, you would send out a crew, a body of people, a group of folk, to go and build a highway so that it would be easy for the king to get there. You, would prob you wouldn't in impolitely just ask the king to come without preparing a smooth and easy way for the king to get there. Some of us start thinking about that or are in that mindset as we get our houses ready 
for Christmas. We start smoothing it out in order for the king to come. We start smoothing it out, so we start putting up Christmas trees, putting up Christmas decorations, so forth and so on. We find ourselves getting caught up in that. And some of us find frustration when we actually do that because it's just one more thing to do. But can I tell you something, that in our Old Testament scripture, when we see Isaiah using this image, it is one thing also that describes our own spiritual lives. For joy to, to come for some of us, we should prepare a way in our hearts and in our souls. You see, we got to get in the sense of not just anticipation, but we're getting in the sense of preparation. Preparing for the joy to come. See, if we cannot produce joy, if we can't make it happen, and we can't, Isaiah says, then you got to make a way then for joy to come to you. So there are some things that the prophet Isaiah says that we can do to make a way for joy to come to us. The first thing that he tells us about is that joy, if joy is going to come to us, it will come on a highway in the desert. Think about this. One of the things that I have to do myself, even in my own house, is I need to clean my house before I pull out, before I start pulling out the decorations to prepare. And sometimes that can take a little bit of time. And for some of us to clean out our own house, it means that we have to deal with the desert that is in place. You see, joy comes to us at the places where we have some desert-like and empty spaces. It is in the unexcited, empty places of our own lives where we remove the clutter that we like to fill our, our lives up with. We start to having to have to deal with that stuff because now what you're doing is you're starting to move things out of the way and put other things up to prepare for the coming. Joy comes to us on a highway through the empty spaces and places in our own lives. It comes to us through this highway in the desert and the places in our lives that we have emptied. And it's hard to empty our lives of all the stuff and all the activity that we fill it up with. But unless we clear out our lives and make space for it, there is no way for joy to find its way to us. See, I can understand that part. Because in essence, we must want to clear the way. We must want to humble ourselves in order to experience the fullness of this essential gift. It's not about our own glory, but it's about opening a way so that we can give God the glory. You see, beloved, the idea of joy makes people feel good and warm. That's true. And because of that, we find the allure of joy to be attractive and worthy of those statements that affirm us and give us encouragement. Theme of the day is what the essentials. So why is it that joy is essential? Well, the first one is joy is not necessarily the absence of suffering, but it is the presence of God. In John 15 and 11, we are told that I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. But when things are going well, let me tell you, let me say that again. When things are going well, we find ourselves on fire. And when the storm comes, we fall into a depression. But true joy will overtake the circumstances because in order to believe in our heart that there's going to be some things that are happening, you must have a consistent relationship with Jesus Christ. For when our lives are woven with the life of Jesus, he will be the very one who is going to walk us through those storms without us sinking. And he's going to be the very thing that's going to help us to clear that path out of the way for the coming of Jesus Christ and for the coming of that joy. For the joy of walking with Jesus will keep us grounded. No matter the intensity of the storm, it's not about the fact that we're going to not have any suffering. It's about the fact that God is present. The second is, joy is the illumination of God's love. You see, there's a contemporary interpretation of this principle as it's intertwined in a quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., when Dr. King says, hate paralyzes life, love releases it. Hate confuses life, love harmonizes it. Hate darkens life, but love illuminates it. You see, in Philippians 4, verses 4 and 5, when it says, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say again, rejoice. 
Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. What this is just simply telling us in this passage is that our outward circumstances should not dictate what our inner attitude is or perspective. See, Paul himself was full of joy because he knew that no matter what happened to him, Jesus Christ was with him. Yes, in this letter to the Philippians, Paul tells them and urges them and pleads with them to be joyful. But sometimes as human beings, we have a habit of getting easily discouraged. We have a habit of sometimes thinking about and giving too much attention to some of these important things that you call important. But ultimate joy comes from the fact that Jesus dwells within inside of our spirits. And if we must realize and have a confidence that with Jesus in our, in our inside lives, we must realize and know that when we have that, we're going to have a confidence that Jesus dwells in everything that we take care of. You see, when we have joy in our own lives, when we carry Jesus in our own lives, there's just going to be some things that come out, and it's going to call, and we call it that joy. The third thing is that this Christmas, don't leave the Christmas gift behind. Don't leave it under the tree. I told this story before, and I'll, and I, and I'll say this one again, is that I, I I can remember back when we were growing up and my mother would always prepare for Christmas. We would get the house ready, we put the tree up, we put up all of the decorations, and she would go out and buy all these gifts for not just her children, and her, her, but she would specifically buy them for her nieces and nephews. And as we got older, she would buy for grandnieces and nephews and grandchildren and all of those. But I can remember that we, we, we would actually wait for them to come over, and they would come over and they would get their gifts. But we could always tell who left the Christmas gift behind because they were the ones who never came to get the gift. We would go all the way, sometimes all the way into the summer. She would still have the gift waiting for them. The tree was down. The decorations were put away. But the gift was still waiting for them in the corner. And when they finally did show up, with a smile on her face, she would tell them, and no judgment, she would say, here is your Christmas gift. You see, making a way for joy is the result of knowing who he is. And joy is knowing why he came. The last one is, Making a way for joy means becoming vulnerable so that God can do his work and we can experience true joy. See, the contemporary professor, the contemporary professor Dr. Brene Brown, states that vulnerability has the potential to transform itself into joy. Can I tell you something? Some t-shirts can tell your story. Some of you know that I really like to wear certain t-shirts. I'm really not a t-shirt wearer unless it has something on it unless it has some phrase on it that's, that has meaning to me. T-shirts tell a story. I like them when they have that message. More specifically, I like a message that can tell just a little bit about my story. When I see a T-shirt that goes on and on about certain things, so I have some T-shirts that talk about Black Lives Matter, I have some T-shirts that talk about my life as an educator, I have some T-shirts that talk about my faith, but see, let me tell you something. When I see or when I have seen some t-shirts that speak about joy, I see that they are testimonies to somebody. I see that this is a testimony about what's been going on in my life. Most recently, I saw this t-shirt that says, my joy is, I'm, she says, I'm staying in my joy because God said I could. And when I see another one, an old so famous one that says, don't let anyone steal your joy. You see, that's a testimony for somebody, and it's a testimony and a witness to the person who is actually wearing it. You see, when we get into the understanding of our own vulnerability, it is when we start to truly understand the complexity of one's own joy. But in the same right, if we start to protect our own joy, we're going to find that these t-shirts that walk around us every day is going to give us a reason to profess who we follow and who we are followers of. You're going to tell somebody who is walking in the midst of the world and all of the worldly thoughts that you cannot steal my joy 
Why? Because maybe at some point in time, my joy was at that point where it could be stolen. But I gotta be vulnerable. And I have to say, I have to be very upfront with God and transparent about what is going on because I am in the business of protecting my joy. You see, true joy comes from knowing who God is. It comes from knowing that God loves us and it comes from knowing that God cares for us. And we have to get into a moment when we realize that we must protect our joy because there's always gonna be somebody out there who wants to steal our joy. Somebody who wants to stumble your call and stumble your walk and follow in Jesus Christ. And you must give them that message and be vulnerable to God so that when your true joy comes out, you let somebody know that you cannot steal my joy. It comes from the assurance that no matter, no matter what happens, we know that God is in control. But joy comes from the confidence in the one who is in control of, our, of all things rather than in our circumstances at the moment. It doesn't just fall on us like it's something that's coming out of the sky. It's, it's something that we must obtain. So this grace from God comes with a little bit of work. So how is it that we, 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 we attain this joy? How is it that we hold on to it? It comes from spending time with God. It stems from spending time praising God. And time with God and praising God just doesn't happen on Sunday. For as we praise him, we enter his presence, where there is a fullness of joy. For we find it in Psalm 22, 3. He says, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises, by praises of your people. You shall, you will show path, me the path of life, for in your presence is fullness of joy. It also comes from spending time in prayer and spending time in the word. And it comes from recognizing that God was with you in your trials and your tribulations when you were not able to see through the fog of confusion or the darkness that had not given you any form of life. But this means we can be joyful even in the difficult times. Sometimes, uh, 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 I, will, I can honestly say that sometimes we have been very isolated in our own individuality with things that are going on in our lives. This pandemic has showed us that collectively, we might be going through some things, but it also is that time now when God says, if this is my time for you to spread the good news about who I am. You see, joy is a game changer because it reminds us of who we are. Not that I'm Vicki, not that I'm Greg, not that I'm Mark, not that I'm David, not that I'm Brother Blake. It reminds us of who we belong to. And it makes us question in how we handle the things that have come through us in the past. See, true joy comes from having a resting in Jesus Christ, having a resting in God and trusting him to take care of those things that are out of our control. It means that we can live life to the fullest no matter what happens. That we can keep doing what God has created for us to do, and not only that, we can do it with some level of excitement. It doesn't mean that we won't be sad. It doesn't mean that we have to pretend that everything is right when it's not. But it does mean that we should be people who are not beaten down by the circumstances of the world. We should be people who are not paralyzed by the fear of what if. Instead, we should follow the Lord with real joy in every circumstance, trusting that, we, we, that, that he will work all things out for the good. See, Christmas joy creates an aroma that is present all throughout the world. We see it this time of the year, but we need to still see it on January 2nd, March the 1st, June the 1st, and August the 1st. We, may, we still need to see it during those times. So as I get ready to take my seat, I was at a prayer gathering yesterday with some of my sorority sisters. And we were praying for a chapter in Indianapolis. 
who has lost four of its members in the last two weeks. Four of its members have passed and gone on to glory within the last two weeks, and all were in different age groups. There was a story that was told there, a story about two Florida teenagers. <coughs> we had two Florida teenagers who had hoped for a miracle from God while stranded in the ocean for two hours, trying to hold each other up as they grew weaker two miles off the coastline. These two, Tyler and Heather, began to pray. See, the 17-year-olds have been celebrating Senior Skip Day, but got caught up in the current while swimming on the beach. They shivered uncontrollably as their skin turned pale. Smith, or, or Tyler, reached out and cried out and said, if you really if, if, if you really do have a plan for us, like, come on, just bring something. Then the crew came aboard a boat and had heard the cries from over the winds and the waves and the noise of the engine. You see, he had been reaching out to God when he said, if you really do have a plan for us, come on, just bring something. God. It's kind of surprising what we heard from them, especially when they were about 100 and feet away, or almost 250, excuse me, yards away. But it, it, it was definitely the scream that we had heard and why we were looking around, because they had screamed out. So the men who were sailing from South Florida, New Jersey, pulled the shaking teenagers out of the water and pulled them aboard. And the first thing that came out of my mouth, the captain said, was God is real. You see, the crew called the Coast Guard for a rescue boat and tried to warm the teenagers with the blankets. But the teens were able to talk normally again after 10 minutes. Tyler later cried in the hospital, amazed for their own survival. But the captain stated that there were too many coincidences that happened, in my opinion, for this to be even be a coincidence. He said, I truly believe that it was divine intervention. It had nothing to do with me. I was just put there at the right place at the right time, and I did the same thing anyone else would have done. I pulled them aboard. You see, the name of the boat was the name Amen. The name of the boat was the boat was named Amen. So let's take this season to restore our joy. For the word Amen is the most remarkable word because it was translated directly from the Hebrew into the Greek of the New Testament into the Latin and into the English and into many other languages. Therefore, it becoming a very universal word. For it means so it be, so be it, may it be fulfilled. Let me say it again. It means so it be, so it is, so be it, may it be fulfilled. You see, amen is the same word in many languages because there are few things in the world that unites all people. It's a smile and it is the word amen. A smile can be contagious and so can the word amen. But the word that we deal with today and we have dealt with over and over again, the word that we have dealt with today and we deal with over and over again is the word contagious. Contagious. And it has been a word that has been overused in the year of 2020. More probably than the word amen. But COVID-19 has given us a definition to this word contagious. We, we, we have had to learn how to stay in isolated situations in order to not get the virus and so that we also did not spread the virus. In essence, we did not want to be contagious. But the coronavirus has also set up for us in a season where hurt is contagious, fear is contagious, grief is contagious, unhappiness is contagious, instability is contagious, and all other forms of emotions and state of being that has caused us to question what is going on in the world. But can I tell you something? God has set us up in a season of contagious situation that shows us that the joy that he gives us is indeed contagious. God has set us also up in this season to make a man contagious because joy shows us about our own vulnerability. Joy shows up in our dark moments. Joy shows up in our midnight hour, but joy is contagious because God has always been ever present in all mix of trials and tribulations.
tribulation. This contagious joy is ever present in our current situation. But I have to be more specific when I identify that the current situation that is going on is a season that we are in that says even now. You see, even now means that despite what darkness we feel that we're in and with the world and how the world saturates us with even now the God of peace and the God of hope and the God of joy is doing some things. It is where we find that in even now is a genuine definition of courageous joy. You see, even now we can still have the gift of joy. Even now we can still understand how essential joy is to our daily life. Even now we can change our perspective on what it means about contagious joy. Even now we can spread the love of God through a contagious smile. Even now we can give voice to the goodness of God through contagious testimonies, even now in the midst of our loneliness and isolation, even now in the frailty of our confusion, even now when things just don't seem like they're getting any better. Remember that the greatest gift of all is the birth of a baby who we call a wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace, the birth that would no longer be contained, but rather this is a gift of contagious joy. Even now we can still say amen. amen. For the gift of joy will follow you with all the way to heaven. But the contagious gift will follow us through this journey, the journey to follow. For just like the psalmist sings and says, for when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. For when we all see Jesus, we gonna shout and sing the victory. For joy gives victory a chance. And joy gives, amen, an opportunity to spread in this contagious situation. For it will be, for even now, joy is contagious. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. My name is Vicki Pruitt Sorrell, and I'm the pastor here at Lehigh Community Church. And I want to thank you for viewing our worship service. Here at Lehigh Community Church, we are a community of believers called to carry the message of God's peace throughout the world and in our community. All people are invited to join us on Sundays at 11 o'clock for our spirit-filled worship service. If you're unable to make it to church on Sunday, Please consider liking, sharing, or subscribing to our channel. And don't forget to ring the notification bell.